The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to it. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're on the road here at The Graduate in Minneapolis. We made it happen. We grabbed the flight. We got landed and the great folks here for a third road show in a row here at The Graduate right across from Gopher Stadium. We're gearing up for Nebraska, Minnesota and happy to have you along with Hale Varsity Radio on the road powered by your friends at Sauter Heyman and Lazari's. Elijah, you're hunkered down, just all sorts of excitement, energy, uh, enthusiasm, and oh yes, attendance at Memorial Stadium as things are underway in about a half hour with part one of Volleyball Day in Nebraska. Nebraska, of course, takes to the Nets at seven, uh, and then in uh, just a few short hours, a little less than, a little more than 24 hours, it'll be uh, game one. Uh, for the Matt Rule era, era. Uh, numbers to get in can join us today here on Hale Varsity Radio at 489-1240, 489-1240, and uh, can also dial it up uh, 800-825-5865. can email the show chris at halevarsity.com. To my left, some Husker fans. There's a, a few more Husker fans kind of over by the fire pit. It's gorgeous here in Minneapolis and uh, the uh, dude who picked me up <laughs> from the airport, uh, just an, an awesome guy. Um, let me just tell you this. he He's uh, all about fantasy football. Uh, uh, Matthew, we talked fantasy rosters. We talked his draft. And he took me through the Mississippi River um, neighborhood. Like there's there's all these houses that look like they're straight out of Regency or Sheridan Boulevard if you're from Lincoln, Regency if you're in Omaha, pick your country club regions uh, or Ferris Bueller. And uh, it was just a nice scenic drive, able to decompress. I'm within arm's reach of, uh, of a bar here, Elijah. I mean, it, it's going to work out all right as Nebraska and Minnesota get going here in uh, just short order. Uh, coming up on the show, we'll spend time with Mike Babcock from Hale Varsity. Babber's going to join us, talk about uh, the impact of today with Nebraska volleyball and the statewide and nationwide celebration. Uh, we'll get into the football game for sure with Babbers in hour two. Former Gopher head coach Glenn Mason going to join us. Uh, coach Mason did some great work uh, at Minnesota in the Big Ten for a lot of years. Uh, we'll check in with Evan Bland as he's been covering uh, Nebraska Volleyball Day and then a jock doc, and we'll get ready and do it all again tomorrow. Elijah, are you able to breathe a little easier? We've been in constant contact. The, the flight landed early. It was really cool. Got a chance to, to sit next to Lance Brown, former Husker wideout. Uh, his son's on the team, and they're, they're excited that, uh, that uh, his son, Elliot, made the, the travel roster and uh, there's a lot of hope, a lot of hope for Nebraska here uh, in about 24 hours. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of hope about what Volleyball Day in Nebraska can be here tonight in Lincoln, Schmidt. I'm not sure if you saw any of the coverage of that awesome pep rally they held at the Coliseum, uh, but just some really, really cool moments out there. And, and I think you can already see here in the city of Lincoln what, what Volleyball Day means to the people that have supported this program for a short period of time, a long period of time, uh, new young, old, doesn't matter who you are. This day is truly meaning a lot to a lot of people as uh, we got the, as you said, the first match kicking off here just shortly. There's already some fans into the stadium. A crowd of 90,000 expected on hand tonight. That's the moon, Lincoln. And what a week it is just for, generally speaking, activities within the state of Nebraska and specifically within Lincoln. When you have the air show over the weekend, you have the Black mm-hmm. Keith concert on Sunday night. You have the Luke Bryan, or sorry, Zach Bryan concert last night at Pinnacle Bank Arena. And then you have Volleyball Day. And then you have Nebraska, Minnesota tomorrow night. Like, hats off to you, City of Lincoln, for however the hell you put this together. What a week. Like, 
in terms of my lifetime, I'm trying to think of a week that had more excitement going down. And I know the game tomorrow is not in Lincoln. It's in Minneapolis. That would have been uh, just a cherry on top to everything if the game was in Lincoln. But with all the hustle and bustle and excitement in Lincoln, it's just a really, really good week to be from Lincoln, Nebraska, huh? Absolutely. It's a proud moment to be a, a Nebraska fan. There's quite a few Nebraska fans here milling around as uh, they are in early, getting ready for this uh, historic matchup. Historic because it is game one of the Matt Rule era. And, you know, you, you bump into folks, you talk to them about tomorrow night's game, and you're just, you want it to be different. I think there's some reality attached to it, Elijah, that it is year one, it is game one, and we just, don't know what to expect other than better, better discipline, better tackling, better ball control, better ball security, better run game. I mean, go down the, the dot, 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 better uh, part of this discussion. And, uh, yeah, is better going to be good enough to beat Minnesota? I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. And you get into the, the discussion point of system uh, that Minnesota's had. It's not new. It's not different. They've just got some new faces to, to plug in that have been in the in the program. You've got a, a secondary coach that coached under Tony White. Shout out Vic in Denver for that nugget, and that's been floating around for about a week. Uh, so there's some familiarity with what Coach White may want to do defensively to Minnesota. But it's going to come down to uh, really just being able to, to, to stop the run if you're Nebraska, and get some semblance of a run game. Uh, a couple of things I'm concerned about as we get closer here is just what type of production are you going to get out of Nebraska's wide receiving core? Uh, that's not a knock on the, the, the kids that are out there trying to catch passes, but how much dependency do you want on the road game one for Nebraska's passing attack? You, you want to use that uh, at, at – your whim, not because it's third and nine. And uh, I'm anxious to see uh, what, what Jeff Sims can do, Elijah, at quarterback for Nebraska and see what uh, he can bring to the table because uh, it's going to be one of those tight ball games, we, I think we think, tomorrow night because, well, hey, it's uh, Vegas is telling us that first and foremost, low scoring, uh, low totals, um, spread is six and a half, seven, depending where you look. It's going to be one of those classic Minnesota type ball games. Those are the games that PJ Fleck wins, and those are the games PJ Fleck wins when he's at home. And those are the games they have won against Nebraska in the uh, the, well, the last five seasons. BTN showed Nebraska's last win and only win against Minnesota uh, in the Fleck era just a couple of nights ago, and it was. The, the first year of the Frost era, that 2018, it was Frost's first win in his career where Nebraska had a big lead. They let Minnesota hang around. Minnesota never gave up and turned into a bit of a shootout, and then Nebraska kind of put the, the hammer down at the end. Uh, I don't know that that's going to be a, a recipe tomorrow night offensively for either team, but it's going to come down to a couple of big plays. And one thing that's always screwed Nebraska in their openers – has been special teams the last few years. Think about that. Uh, you, you go back to Illinois, you have the safety, and, and then you have the fake punt that was quite embarrassing. Uh, Babbers is waving at me, so Mike Babcock's in the green room. Secondly, uh, you go back to last year with the, the onside kick that absolutely poured gasoline on your momentum. And, and now, can special teams... <laughs> Just get out of the way in a good way in this opener tomorrow night. I think that's going to have to be part of this recipe for a win tomorrow night for Nebraska is they're going to need good defense, clearly good defense, just enough offense with the kicking game probably in a a stingy defensively hard-fought ball game. And thirdly, you're going to need – uh, some positive field position with the return game. And that's one thing Matt Rule focused on yesterday when he talked was, you know, kickoff or or, or punt return, uh, quote, we're going to return kicks. That's the word from, from Matt Rule. So that's got to show up tomorrow just across the street. 
Yeah, whenever I, I think back in the totality of what we've heard this fall camp, if Matt rules to be believed and he's correct with some of the things we've said, uh, that you know the offensive line is going to be improved this season. They're going to be better at running the football. Jeff Sims and, and his legs is going to be a, an advantageous addition to the rushing attack. The defense is fast and flying around, and I think we can read between the lines with how many single digits got awarded to the defense and assume that that's the unit that's going to be leading this team tomorrow. If all those things are true, does it come down to that that battle of quarterbacks of Jeff Sims versus Kaliak Manis? That's that's a place that my mind has gone today. And that you know what. I think there is a lot of confidence with Gabe Irvin in that rushing attack with the offensive line. And also, I should add what Jeff Sims brings to that in, tr uh, in addition to, to just the straight-up rushing, running back rushing, I should say. The, the, the threat that Sims poses, even if he's not running the ball all that much, the threat that he poses. Jeff Sims, we've talked a lot about his, his career at Georgia Tech, slightly over 50% completion percentage and uh, a lot of interceptions to go with some, some wild plays on film. Can he take that next step? Because that's where my mind has gone today in terms of, you know what, if this defense leads the way and is able to, to slow down the, the Minnesota attack, which also, now that I've listened to Joel Klatt in his preview, maybe some question marks with what their offense is going to look like in my own mind with, with the amount of turnover that they've had there. Does it really come down to, to who is better able to lead their offense in a, in a new look offense? Because I do think that Minnesota offense, now that they, they don't have Mo Ibrahim and now that they've lost some of those offensive linemen, it's probably going to look a little different. In Nebraska's offense, we know it's going to look a lot different from what we've heard from Satterfield and Rule and, and what they're going to be emphasizing early in the season. Is tomorrow's night's game just a question of which quarterback is, is better equipped to lead their offense this early in the season? It might come down to that because how many times in a close ball game, whenever it's a, a three-point game at the end, do you have to put some pressure on your quarterback in that final drive and say, go make a play for us? I, I, I'm, just, I'm just sitting it, here It wonder, is always wondering. about the quarterbacks, right? The management, the playmaking, yeah. the decision-making. And I'll tell you what, I mean, are you wrong to expect, even if it's just game one on the road, are you wrong to expect Jeff Sims to be that difference maker? I, I don't think it's a, a, an unfair expectation. I think if you're a Minnesota fan and you're asking Callie McManus to, to go out and win the ball game for you, good luck and God bless because you've had an offensive line last year that, that sent three guys to the league. You had a running game in Mo Ibrahim that was incredible. And you had a receiving core, and you still have a, a you know an NFL tight end and a really good receiving core, but you're not going to ask Ethan to, to to beat anybody throwing the football. It's the RPO, do some things with his feet that, that can hurt you. Nebraska knows that from watching film. I think the best game that that Kelly McManus had was against Nebraska last year, where he sparked him to his credit. It was the best game of his season last year. I, I think you could make a good yeah. argument for the, the Wisconsin game as well at the end of the year uh, where they go, I think it was on the road, uh, and go beat a, a Wisconsin team that, to be fair, was sputtering a little bit towards the end of last year. But he did pretty well against that defense, uh, over 300 yards passing, 65% completion percentage. But you're, you're right, Schmitty, with what you're saying about Mo Ibrahim and the rushing attack. That was a, a big aid to Cali Manis last year. And that's the big question mark surrounding him is, is this year's offense going to free him up to be to do more of what he likes considering the the receiving threats that they have the the tight end that they have there in uh in span ford i believe is his name uh, is that going to open up his game or is that going to limit his game not having uh, not having a guy behind him such as such as mo ibrahim is there you know there's the two sides to that you don't have the support of a rushing attack a but b if you're a quarterback that likes the ball in his hands does that free you up if you get more than say 20 opportunities in a game to throw the football. You're not going to want to live and in, in be in that neighborhood of asking either of these quarterbacks to win it throwing the football. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to make some throws. They're going to have to take care of the football. They're going to have to hit some big plays, assuming the, the receiving core for Nebraska's offense can, can, can get open and there's some people to throw it to. They're pretty thin there. Uh, Washington will be back, uh, but but is, is he ready to rock and roll? Of course, you got you got uh, Kemp that is so hard to, to cover. Just not the biggest guy in the world, and you know how physical Minnesota's defense is. So, no, I mean you're gonna. I, I like I like my chances when it comes down to uh, if I'm picking a quarterback, give me Sims 
and give me Sims making a play on on that third and uh oh moment, but don't don't make it a two minute drill type situation. Don't make it a throw to win because you're behind. Uh, be able to manage it offensively if you're Nebraska. Keep the run game uh, stout. Keep the run game available. And, and keep it positive. Find find a way to have some success because you don't want it to to turn into a situation where it's 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 Adrian Martinez 2.0 again because you have no running back run game. We'll get into this with Mike Babcock. We'll also celebrate volleyball day in Nebraska. Uh, excited to uh, just see what the turnout is tonight at Memorial Stadium. All sorts of cameras are out. And all sorts of coverage happening with Hale Varsity and your friends at Herd at Sports. So be sure to check all of that coverage out. Uh, made it to Minneapolis. Painless flight from Omaha to Minneapolis. Talk some fantasy football on the way over. I've got some sleepers now for Sunday's draft. Thanks to my uh, Lyft driver, Matthew. God love you. Got me here early. Uh, I was all sorts of stressed and now I can take a breath. Elijah's like, I've burnt through two cartons already, uh, waiting for you to get hooked up. Mike Babcock is with us at Tail Varsity on the road here at the Graduate in Minneapolis. And now, and now back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back to you, Tail Varsity Radio Road Show. We're here at the Graduate in Minneapolis. This is our third adventure up here to the land of 10,000 lakes. Uh, Sadly, I am 0-2 here. That may change. That may change. Uh, We'll see. It's a big ball game tomorrow night. It's a big day in the state of Nebraska. It is uh, volleyball day in the state of Nebraska. Mike Babcock is with us and at MD Babs on Twitter is where you find Mike and uh, you catch him with Hale Varsity. Babbers, what a... What a day in, in Nebraska. What a moment for Nebraska athletics and John Cook and all the celebration that's gone into selling out Memorial Stadium tonight and setting a world record potentially. And, oh, yeah, there's kickoff to the rule era tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, How are you soaking all of this in? You know, it's uh, the volleyball thing, I think, is uh, just remarkable that they're able to do this. I remember – covering Terry Pettit, sitting in his office, interviewing him in the Coliseum. Uh, His office was a converted custodial closet. (laughs) And you couldn't see the assistants from one to the, from one side of the office, the office to the other um, because of the pipes and stuff. Terry would go out on the floor. He'd have to run off all the guys playing, uh, pick up basketball off the floor of the Coliseum so they can set up their own nets so they could practice. And now you're at a position where you're in Memorial Stadium and you can draw 90,000 plus people to watch a volleyball match. It's remarkable. And, you know, I wasn't around when to cover it when it was in Mabel Lee Hall, but I remember Mabel Lee Hall. Um, what a difference uh, in, in women's sports. And it's just a tribute, I think, to the to women's sports in general and to the passion of Nebraska fans, um, whether it be football, volleyball, basketball, whatever. Uh, Nebraska fans are there to support it. It's Mike Babcock with us here, Hale Varsity Radio. And Mike, as we look back at 100 years of Memorial Stadium, when I think of events at Memorial Stadium that were not Husker football, I think it's that Garth Brook concert two years ago, and that's about all I can remember in my lifetime. Are there any I'm, I'm leaving off the list here just in terms of how special this is that the volleyball team gets a chance to play Memorial Stadium? I think Farm Aid, the Farm okay. Aid thing yeah, yeah, was, obviously. A, was a pretty big deal. Um, but uh, certainly, the, you know, this has to be right at the top. Um, who, who would have ever envisioned this thing, you know, that you would – Play a volleyball match in the in the uh, in the stadium, and uh, that you would generate this kind of interest, uh, people wanting to be a part of the experience. I think is 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 the big thing is just to say, hey, I was there when this happened. Um, just remarkable to me. 
Mike, uh, let's get uh, a thought on tomorrow night, Nebraska, Minnesota. We've already dove into some of the the breakdowns. We've already dove into some of the, the, the question marks and thoughts on on how it how it can be a, a positive outcome for the first time in a while. Five games uh, against Minnesota. Mike, Minnesota is one of those teams Nebraska needs to not split with but beat, and they haven't done it because Minnesota and P.J. Fleck have done a better job of developing. They've done a better job of finding ways to get it handled in tight ball games, not just against Nebraska, but they've done so against Wisconsin. Uh, they've played Ohio State okay. They, they've got a Penn State win under their belt. It's them and that's about it. I mean, uh, for, for Western division wins, while well, they still exist over the East. So how big is tomorrow night in, in this grand scheme here? Fleck v. Rule, the first of many, potentially, or maybe not, who knows. But what do you think uh, this game means? Who's it bigger for? Is it bigger for Nebraska or bigger for Minnesota? I think it's bigger for Nebraska, obviously, because it's Matt Rule's first game expectations are high um you know it, it i think about this whenever the season starts you know that that we're around to see spring practice at nebraska we're around to see fall camp at nebraska we're there to hear matt rule talk each day we're here to hear this the assistants talk each day um we're not there to hear pj fleck talk in the spring we're not there to hear pj fleck talk in august so the kinds of things that we hear, um, the optimism that we hear is probably the same thing in Minneapolis, listening to PJ Fleck. You know, you probably come out of it with a really kind of a one-sided, I guess is what I'm saying, sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at a point where I've bought into it right now. You know, I think Nebraska has a good chance to win this game because I've heard Matt Rule say the right things and I've heard Matt Rule emphasize what I think are the right things for this program. And, you know, things like who gets a single digit number and how that's determined. Things like we have 11 black shirts and it's a week to week thing. I think that's important. I think those little details, they're probably not looked at as little for some people, but I think those details are important to the program. His reference to Tom Osborne and being the strongest team in the fourth quarter, you know, using that line about, uh, you know, if you're running a, a, a sprint or a race or whatever, you don't let up at the end. Um, you speed up. You try to speed up. Being the toughest team in the fourth quarter, um, I, I think all those things have got me on board with they're doing the right things. They're tough. They're gritty. They're, they're not going to quit. They're going to go out there and, and give the best effort. And it's going to be a, a kind of a, in some ways, an old style Nebraska team because of the attitude. Mike, one of the things Matt Rules talked about a lot during fall camp has been the fact that he wants to see his team get better every single week. Whenever you look back at the last couple of years of Nebraska football, I mean, you think back to last year with Northwestern first game of the season really was indicative of what we saw, at least until Scott Frost was let go, and if not a little bit longer about what that team was. Back in 2021, you look at the loss to Illinois. It was a close ball game, a one-score loss, but yet you found a way to lose, and I think that was pretty indicative of the season. 2020, we could throw out because of COVID, but you, you play it close against Ohio State, but in the end, you just don't have enough talent to take down that team, which I think is pretty indicative of a lot of games we saw in 2020 as well. And in 2019, uh, you have a a nail-biting win over South Alabama that you never really felt great about, and then you followed up the week after with a loss at Colorado. And both of those games, I think, pretty indicative of what that year was. Do you think that tomorrow night's game will be indicative of this 2023 season for Nebraska? I, for me, it will, because I want to see this team on the field against another team. You know, And, and that's, to me, that it's going to be indicative in, in that sense. And, and again, I just think, I'll give you an example. Um, John Bullock, okay? He earned a scholarship in the spring. He's a walk-on. He earned a scholarship in the spring. He earned a single-digit number in the fall, and he's on the starting lineup. You know, that shows to me that what Rule says 
is not just a bunch of words. He means what he says. Here's a, a guy that walked on. He earned a scholarship. He got a single-digit number. He's a black shirt, and he's starting against Minnesota. That says to me he's followed the process that Rule has laid out. And his brother, incidentally, got a scholarship too, right, just uh, recently? And his yeah, he, both, both Bullock's kids have been – that Nebraska kid that pushes others in the program and then, oh, yeah, because of their hard work and talent have also risen. You know, we, we wonder about Henrich and how's his health? Is he uh, got a lower body injury or is he a game time decision? Possibly is the uh, is that an opportunity for Bullock? Absolutely. Is is the receiving core deep and littered with all Americans, not yet, or and no is the answer. So you got two prep kids that like to hit people. <laughs> I mean, and and they have a they have a shot to be part of the uh, the the solution tomorrow for Nebraska on both sides of the football. Mike, when we when we get into how this happens for Nebraska, and and the 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 topic of momentum and getting off on the right foot and. Man, that'd be a real shot in the arm for Nebraska to go get a win uh, before Minnesota kind of find, finds their bearings, so to speak. How does it happen? How does Nebraska get it done tomorrow night if they do get it done? Control the line of scrimmage up front, offensive line and defensive line. That's where you're gonna. That's where you're gonna succeed or not. And I think that being persistent. And establishing some sort of a running game. You guys talked about that. Um, I think that's important to what Nebraska wants to get done. Um, and it again, it depends on the guys up front. And that I think that Nebraska has. Again, I'm seeing it through a, a limited vision because I don't. I'm not seeing Minnesota day to day to day, or I'm not listening to the what's being said there. But I, I really like what I've heard here about the guys up front, and that's where I think Nebraska is going to have to have the advantage or at least hold its own in order to be successful tomorrow. Mike, are you willing to lock in a prediction for the game? I'm willing to. Uh, you know, I've told you this before. I, the, I used to cover Champaign Central High School. The coach, I, you know, I'd ask him, how, how do you think the game's going to go? And he'd say, um, wait until Sunday, if it was a Saturday game, and then you'll know, and I'll know. <laughs> you would never That's say true. what he expected, but um, I, you, you know, Nebraska wins the game. I think uh, twenty-four to to twenty. Love it from Mike. Look at that. Mike goes against <laughs> win for Mike Babcock in Nebraska. I love it. And I love how Mike lays out why he shouldn't make a prediction, then he goes out and makes a prediction anyway. I love it. Drops the hammer. <laughs> Just says. Mikey I'm Betts right. says, <laughs> Mikey Betts says. <laughs> you know, I predicted Nebraska would beat Georgia Southern last year uh, handily. Uh huh. To be fair, we all did. How did that work? <laughs> there, there was a lot of people grabbing handles uh, during that, that, that post-game soiree. Well, Mike, law of averages says you got to get one right now. I mean, you missed the Georgia Southern. You got to get one right. And you're saying Nebraska money line, parlay it with the overs. I love it. Yeah, yeah, and there's, uh, you know, Tristan Alvano is going to kick a field goal, and and uh, you're going to get three touchdowns, uh, and the defense is going to be uh, staunch. Okay. What I'm saying. Mike Babcock uh, joining us, Hale Varsity Radio on the road here in Minneapolis. Babbers, we will check in uh, tomorrow morning with you on KFOR, bud. Hey, thanks for having me, guys, and yes, I'll be up. Appreciate you. Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? When I point you, yeah. On Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out. Hail Varsity Radio on the road. We're here in Minneapolis getting sent for Nebraska, Minnesota tomorrow. Of course, uh, road show here in Minneapolis uh, through Friday. Big thanks to The Graduate again, third year. We've been up here at uh, The Graduate. Uh, thanks to our 
Roadshow Partners help empower these road trips for Minnesota, Colorado, Michigan State, uh, friends at Sauter Heyman, and our friends at Lazari's Pizza. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, as uh, Elijah holding it down. Good stuff from Jacob Padilla from Hale Varsity. Give him a follow at Jacob Padilla underscore. He is on site. He is courtside for Volleyball Day in America. I know that's on the minds of many as uh, Nebraska will get uh, the, well, a hero's welcome and salute tonight at 7 o'clock. So let's get through some of the stream yard comments. So we'll get to some of your emails. Glenn Mason scheduled to join us at 5. Uh, Evan Bland will join us as uh, part of Volleyball Day in Nebraska slash America. Happens. Uh, we'll talk with Evan about 525. So Brett chimes in. I uh, love hearing from, from Brett. Uh, happy game day eve. GBR, sink the boat. So I'm in, well, yes, I'm, I'm a, again, a bad tee shot away from the stadium here, my bad tee shot. And you had all sorts of students here hunkered down. They're studying. They're listening to the show. There's a few that are getting coffee. There's others that have already started drinking heavily. I'm kidding. But they've, um, they've got options here. Um, well, that brings, up, that, asks, I say, that brings up an appropriate question. From Cutter, Cutter asks an appropriate question. Is it? When is the appropriate time to crack a cold one tomorrow? And I'm just going to tell you, Cutter, you're the doctor. Okay? You do it. Whenever you're ready, whenever you're thirsty. The, the, the complicating factor tomorrow is work for most people. But my advice to you is think about, if, think about a 7 o'clock you, PM You're kickoff. walking down that, that animal house line of thinking. My advice to you is to start drinking. Well, the, I'll just say. What time Great would you start drinking for a 7 p.m. Husker home game on a Saturday? If you're going downtown, what time would you start drinking? We're talking noon, noon, lunchtime. Yeah. So if you get a lunch break at work tomorrow, hey, there's a the great Jimmy Buffett song. I guess it's Jimmy Buffett. There's and, no wrong answer. And, and, and Alan Jackson. It's five o'clock somewhere. Sure. It could be in Europe. Uh, it could be Hawaiian time. But you're right. It is 5 o'clock somewhere. That's going to be a, a question we need answered. We need to kind of let that marinate for a little bit. What's the, uh, what time do you start imbibing? And you don't have to drink booze. Maybe it's not your thing. I get it. Maybe it is. And I know a lot of you have held on to it like grim death the last few years because of how much of a roller coaster it's been. And uh, Cutter's ready to, to, to scream. Brent says, Cheers. Brent, hope you're doing all right. Cheers, fellas. Here's to hoping for a Husker victory and three Cohawk volleyball victories as they're in Minneapolis this week. And he wants Monday to be a good day. Totally agree. We'll get to some more of your comments. You're always welcome to chime in on the stream. Hail Varsity YouTube channel and the Hail Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio uh, is where you can find it. That's where the show is going to be streaming as well. Uh, not only for tomorrow uh, with the uh, show four to six leading up here from the graduate, but also post game real red reaction uh, crew wants to know cutter. If you work tomorrow, who cares? Start in the morning. <laughs> Are you working or not? I hope this is part of the extended soiree into football season and, and celebrating volleyball. I hope you were able to take off today or at least work a half a day to get down to Memorial Stadium so you can see Nebraska and UNO tonight at 7. You pace yourself. Maybe you get in the car 6 a.m., drive up to the game. I know it's a gold out. It's sold out. But there's going to be a lot of red tomorrow making their way here, which is impressive. Always is. They just want a different result. They also want these type of temperatures. It's, it's, it's Minnesota nice as always this time of year, it's always just a little bit cooler than whatever thousand percent humidity you were used to in, in Lincoln or Omaha or the state of Nebraska. Now, decent temperatures this week, but it feels awesome as we're driving through uh, along the, the banks of the Mississippi through these, again, Ferris Bueller neighborhoods. Awesome scene that's just kind of off to the... Um, got uh, the, the the southern part of campus here there's people out walking their dog they're running they're scootering 
and and all these houses that we drove and one is kind of winding through they have all these uh vantage points and they're monstrous houses they're as big as fraternity houses that's what we're talking about when i say country club style houses they've all got front porches elevated like on the second floor it, it, it was really fascinating. I'm going to go make some friends later is what I'm telling you, Elijah. Welcome to House Sit Hunters with deck. Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbal. Yeah. <laughs> Live from Minneapolis. <laughs> Big Ted edition. <laughs> Big Ted edition. So, yeah, we'll figure out what the appropriate time is to start going. Brett emails in Chris at HaleVarsity.com, and he is challenging me and says, uh, if you don't toss a beverage while doing the show, you're a turd. So the name calling has always started, uh, but that's okay. We'll hear a little bit from Joel Klatt coming up as he has his breakdown. Him and Gus are on the call. Uh, I'm anxious to see just where Nebraska, from a poise standpoint, comes in as well, Elijah, because that has been missing. Uh, Tweet comes in and can always follow the show, uh, do so. At uh, HVAR City Radio, uh, that's uh, where you go with it. Uh, Husker in Manhattan answers a couple of questions. One, Husker in Manhattan starting drinking tomorrow at noon. Yep, good time. Husker in Manhattan says, look, Matt's a better coach than Frost. He only has to be seven points a game better to win nine games this year. Fair point. Husker in Manhattan Glenn Mason is RSVP, so the former Gopher coach going to be with us in about 15 minutes. More of your comments. Um, we have back and forth discussion discussion going on here from Brent and Cutter. Um, Brent is suggesting. Uh, <laughs> Brent's like, look, you you should be three deep right now in celebration of Volleyball Day in Nebraska. Yeah, today- and that's what's cool too. Elijah, you can go have a beer. Once the show's done, you can hightail it, find a spot, go watch volleyball tonight, and have a cold one because this is your trial balloon for football season 2024. And truthfully, to today, or more accurately, tomorrow, it's one of the only days where you can, if somebody asks you what's an appropriate time to start drinking, yesterday is an appropriate response. If someone says, hey, what time should I start drinking today? Yesterday. Well, it actually checks mm-hmm. out today with a volleyball day at 7 o'clock. I mean, if you want to tie one on, get it going right now. That's I don't. You got the opportunity. Listen, you 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 certainly do, but you can you can pace yourself, or you could not. You can you you can you can. <laughs> says the mid twenty year old. I love it. Or you cannot. You can just pour some more salt on it, rub some dirt on it, figure it out that way. Uh, Glenn Mason coming up. We'll spend time with Evan Bland, also covering. Volleyball day in Nebraska. Hail Varsity, we are already in Minneapolis. We're here at The Graduate, getting ready for Nebraska, Minnesota. Hail Varsity presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out. It's Hail Varsity Radio Roadshow here in Minneapolis. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Yes. How are you doing? Good to see you. Husker fans ready to go. They're uh, set and ready. Uh, many Nebraska fans arriving, many still at Memorial Stadium or finding their way to Memorial Stadium. Again, uh, follow Jacob Padilla and his uh, courtside seat in reporting. Uh, more comments we'll get to. Glenn Mason next hour. And uh, you have just a really good setup. Uh, Mark Cranach should be in tomorrow. At some point, Bill Dolman making his way into maybe Friday for sure. I don't know. I mean, this state may not be able to hold all the Hale Varsity Big Red Invasion, Elijah, but it is coming. And this this is such an old classic hotel. I've never really ventured up to the second floor before here at the Graduate, but they've got this blue velvet steps I just need Zeppelin 4 song for to start playing if I were to ascend up the staircase and film it. 489-1240, 489-1240. If you want to dial up or can send an email, chris at hailvarsity.com. Elijah, who do we got? 
Uh, we had somebody, and they were not on the line. So if uh, you just tried us, give us a call back. In. Give us a call back. I'm here waiting for you. I'm looking for that light to start flashing. I'll, I'll pick up your phone call. You're good. Uh, Real Red Reaction follows Nebraska, Minnesota immediately following on the social streams and also uh, on KFOR. So uh, locally there, be sure to check that out. I uh, want to remind you about Buckling up, it is so important to do it. Many of you are jumping on the road or going to get on the road uh, and drive up to Minnesota for tomorrow night's kickoff. When you do that, it is imperative you you buckle up. And when you do buckle up, uh, remember hands and eyes uh, on the wheel and just make sure you focus hands on the wheel, eyes and mind straight ahead, rather. The driver has one job. That's to drive a, a message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Eventually got it. Eventually got it. We'll just pace ourselves here for a second hour. Is able to get uh, from Omaha to Minnesota. Uh, I got the be careful, do not get arrested warning text from the wife. That's important. Appreciate her doing that. Uh, Brandon's chiming in saying get it going, thumbs up, hit it now, as they're cheering Cutter on for a, a an early beer. So that's the way to do it when we talk uh, about your ways to watch the show. It's archived, podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, be sure to get that handled and subscribed to. We uh, Do we have a uh, another caller or no? No. No. Man, they, they, this is this is like bluegill stealing your bait. We are in the land of 10,000 lakes. Everyone loves fishing in Minnesota. Great fishing in the state of Nebraska, of course, just like volleyball. Because guess what? It is volleyball day in the nation, thanks to Nebraska volleyball and the other in-state schools that are participating. Uh, we'll get back to football with uh, a gopher himself. Won a lot of ball games. Pulled off some big-time wins and uh, was the standard in Minnesota for a lot of years, still is. Glenn Mason joins us to kick off Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity on the road here in Minneapolis. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbal. Back with you, Tower 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're on the road here at the Graduate in Minneapolis, just a option pitch away from the stadium nebraska minnesota the stadium memorial stadium jam-packed for tonight volleyball day in nebraska volleyball day in america working on a world record crowd for a women's sporting event uh pretty awesome uh next couple of days if you're a nebraska football fan a nebraska volleyball fan or you just love sports Big Ten season's about to get underway early for the Gophers and Huskers. We welcome in uh, Hall of Fame coach uh, Minnesota and Kansas. Uh, did great work at uh, Kent State and also uh, at Ohio State as an assistant for many years. Always love talking ball with Glenn Mason as he joins us to get things kicked off here at Hale Varsity. Coach, thanks for a few minutes. How's your summer been? It's been great, and I, I had to chuckle that only a Nebraska Husker could say, just a pitch away from the stadium. <laughs> well, we, we still miss the option, uh, the short side option on third and three, Coach. I mean, you knew it was coming, right? Well, so much of what Tom Osborne did with that offense, and that's what made them so great, everybody knew it was coming, and you still <laughs> couldn't stop it. You know, that's uh, the thing that used to drive me crazy. I'd stand on the sideline, and I'd say, here comes the counter throwback to the tight end. Everybody knew it was coming, and it still worked every time. Well, that's, uh, that's what makes you smile as a coach. If, if you're running it, they can't stop it. It makes you go gray and pull your hair out if you, you know it's coming and you can't do a thing about it. Right, Coach? 
Oh, it makes you, yeah, you're right. You're Tom Osborne, he's smiling, and if you're playing against him, you're crying. But that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> I, I want to get into Glenn Mason is with us here and coach you, you've been a part of this city for a lot of years and it's we love coming up here to, to cover Nebraska Minnesota it's a lot warmer and beautiful right now compared to the uh, the John Facenda weather that we're, we're typically talking to you uh, in, in November uh, with Nebraska Minnesota but tell me what Coach Fleck has done to make the Gophers so solid. And your thoughts in tight ball games, that's hurt Nebraska. There's a lot of positive feelings, though, that it'll change under Matt Rule. He's pretty adamant, Coach, about becoming a fourth quarter team. And, and that might be another opportunity tomorrow night in, in a tight ball game. I think PJ, you know, has done a good job. And, and uh, you know, you got to credit Minnesota. They've you know, you, you see that uh, they finally got out of the dome and they got into the Huntington Bank Stadium there, which is, uh, you know, it's it's a thousand times better than when you try to recruit, uh, you know, to the dome, to that place, and what they've done for the facilities. PJ's done a good job, but I can tell you, um, uh, from a distance, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Matt Rules. And, you know, uh, Matt Rule is a player at Penn State my first year uh, when I was at uh, Minnesota. And uh, then I had the opportunity to cover one of his first games when I was working for the Big Ten Network uh, when he was at Temple playing against Penn State. And you sit there and you watch, and, you know, i got to be honest with you, doing the TV, there's a lot of bad coaching out there. And when guys doing a good job uh, of coaching, it really sticks out. And that stuck out with Matt Rule. I was not surprised at all the success that he had at Temple. And then what he did at Baylor – is nothing short uh, than a miracle. I can tell you that program was in total disarray with all kinds of problems, and he didn't do it uh, anyway except uh, getting guys to play hard and coaching them up. And, you know, maybe he didn't have uh, all the best players, you know, to begin with, but they sure played like they were the best players. It's Glenn Mason with us here, Hale Varsity Radio. And, Coach, as you look at Matt Rule in Nebraska, a lot of people in the national media and even in Nebraska media think that this is going to be a slow build to bring Nebraska back to where a lot of people around here think it should be. But then as things tend to go, you get closer and closer to the first game, a lot of Husker fans now thinking, you know what, maybe he can make some noise in year one. And I want to get your take. With with all the bad coaching you say you've seen in college football and you think Matt Rule's a good one, how much do you think a, a good coach can get done in one offseason to turn things around whenever a program really isn't in the depths of the likes of Baylor following their scandal or, or Temple with all the, the limitations around there? What can be done in one offseason? Well, well I, I don't think Matt Rule is a good one. I think he's a, a great one. I would, I would warn Husker fans, and this is you know, one of my philosophical things, you, know, you don't put quality into a program overnight, nor do you take it out overnight. And what uh, Bob Devaney and Tom Osborne had built at Nebraska was unbelievable. And then for a variety of reasons, and I've got my opinions on that, the, you know, the quality of the program started you know, going the wrong way, slowly but surely. Uh, you, know, ever, you, know, you think, I'm sure a lot of people said, why the heck did we ever fire Frank Solich? I mean, that guy was uh, unbelievable. And then, you know, Bo Pelini had his problems, but he was winning nine uh, games uh, a year. Uh, but it's gone the, the wrong way. And, and there's no doubt in my mind uh, that Matt Rule will make the Cornhuskers better. Will he get them back to where uh, Devaney and Oswin had? I'm not sure. I mean, that's, a, you know, that's to an elite level. But one of the things that, uh, you know, I, was, I, I really thought Scott Frost would do a better job on, uh, and I remember I'm, my history with the Hornhuskers, Hornhuskers is the old, Black shirt defense, and I, I tell you, what they were talking about for years as being black. I was wearing black shirts, and I think Trev Alberts would be the first guy, to, you know, to uh, attest to that. Uh, but I really think that he'll make them better defensively, and uh, I think that becomes the cornerstone uh, of any program. And uh, you know, football's changed, you know, quite a bit, uh, you know, since those days. But uh, Matt Rule, through fundamentals and hard work and confidence to those kids, he'll make them better. Glenn Mason's with us, uh, Hall of Fame football coach, time at Minnesota, uh, took the Gophers bowling every year, uh, some monster wins. He knows the Twin Cities so well and 
really elevated the, the, the Gopher football program to new heights. Uh, also, his time at Kansas I had the Jayhawks in the top 10. And, Coach, you touched on Coach Rule, and you, and you think he's a great coach, and Nebraska is excited to see what he can do. What are some characteristics you see in Matt Rule that you think make him – in that rarefied air why why do you think he is great i mean let's let's i i know what you do at temple and baylor yes the, the win totals the flips the turnarounds that's that's incredible but just specifically as as you look at coach rule as a teacher as a motivator as a fundamental uh guy what what is is great about him in your opinion from coach to coach what do you see in his ability that can, can really elevate Nebraska? Well, I, I, can, I can answer that by uh, making a generalization. Matt Rule loves the coach. And nowadays, I think, you know, there's only two types of coaches out there. There's guys that love the coach, and there's other guys that love being the coach, you know, because of the salaries, the perks, and everything that goes into it. Uh, when I say a throwback, old school, guys got into – Coach and I think Tom Osborne would be the first to tell you that. You never thought you'd ever get rich, and you worked your tail off in long hours, and your family uh, struggled, uh, but you did it because you had a passion, you know, for coaching. And guys didn't get in coaching or stay in coaching unless they had that passion. Well, nowadays, because it's so lucrative, there's a lot of guys flying around out there. Uh, they can't coach their way out of a paper bag. Uh, but they're at a school that's a half, and uh, they have all the built-in uh, pluses. And those guys just love being the coach. But Matt Rule, I, I think he'd be – I don't know what he's making. I'm sure he's making a lot of money at Nebraska, but he's one of those guys that they, if you said, hey, listen, we're out of money, we can't pay you, the guy would still show up and coach. It's Glenn Mason with us here, Hale Varsity Radio. And, Glenn, let's – Quickly flip it around and talk about the guy that's going to be on the other sideline tomorrow night in P.J. Fleck because there's a lot of opinions out there. I, from the outside looking in, think of, of P.J. Fleck as a guy that loves to coach rather than a guy who loves being the coach. So, so take me through what you think of P.J. Fleck. There's been some off-season drama around P.J. Uh, with some of that news that broke just before Big Ten Media. I want to get your thoughts on what he's done with the Minnesota football program. Well, any of that stuff that breaks in the media, you know, you got to take a, you know, you know with, with a grain of salt, but... Uh, you know, I judge uh, the, the PJ. Uh, his approach is different, a lot different than you know mine would have been. Uh, and he's the first one to tell you he's not for everybody. Uh, but uh, when people fit into that and they buy into that and, and all that is stuff, he's high energy. Uh, it works when when you when you peel all this stuff away. Uh, he's he's a darn good you know football coach. Uh, he gets them playing hard. They're playing, you know, good defense. They're good in the special teams. And, you know, let's face it, Minnesota is not one of those programs that's a half program. Now, Minnesota people don't like to hear that, uh, but there's a reason why each and every year when you look at uh, the people that recruit the best players in the country, the Iowa States, the Michigans, the Alabamas, the, you know, Texas, the Southern Cal, Cal's in the old days, you know, Nebraska, uh, there is a reason there you never see – uh, schools like Minnesota or Indiana uh, listed in, in that same life for whatever reason. I, I, I can't tell you that. Uh, but he's done a, a good job here. He gets them playing hard. He gets playing an exciting brand of football. Uh, and he utilizes his good players. Now, you know, he had a quarterback, Tanner Morgan, that was around here for a long time. Well, he's gone. And Mo Ibrahim was a running back that was just about as tough as anybody can be. Those are going to be tough players to replace, I promise you. Coach, what do you think of, of tomorrow night? Uh, tight ball game. Vegas says it's going to be a you know twenty one seventeen type ball game potentially. And uh, do you have a, a lean or a, a gut on on how things uh, shake out under the lights tomorrow night? Well, I never. When I was a, a coach, I never liked uh, playing a, a coach and a team in their first game. Uh, you know, normally they're. Uh, man, if, if they're going to be ready to play, if they're going to be excited to play, it's that first game under a new coach. So, obviously, you're going to you know get their their best shot. You normally get the best shot in opening game anyway. But you know, I'm not I'm not a better. I, I don't I don't bet games and stuff. But I've always you know looked at the betting lines for you know for whatever reason, and I I see that uh, Vegas has them uh, 
They go for seven and a half point favorites. I think that's a lot of points. If I was a better, I'd take the Huskers. I want to ask you, Coach, about the Minnesota job. And you won nine, ten ball games, minimum eight ball games. You did that a lot of years. Uh, and uh, Jerry Kill did well. And then Fleck has done well. But is it difficult to to coach at Minnesota? And I ask that because of, of all the – the pro sports in town. Is there a bit of a, a shadow over some really good things that's going on at, at, at the University of Minnesota football-wise? Is it a difficult space to be in, in a pro town? Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's really tough to be a major college football program, football coach in the same city where there's pro sports, NFL teams, uh, uh, you know, especially. You, know, you look around the country and you try to find some place where they have an NFL team and – uh, also a great football program. It, it, it really, you know, it just doesn't happen. And uh, there's a lot of attention that goes to, you know, to the NFL team um, from from the media standpoint. You know, you pick up uh, the Star Tribune any day, and you're gonna, year-round you're going to find something about uh, the Vikings on page one or two. And a lot of times you're going to go through all the sports that you're not going to find anything about the golfers. And I think that has an effect on your fans, and I know it has an effect on your recruits. Glenn Mason with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Glenn, one of the things P.J. Fleck talked about in his, his press conference last week was that whenever he took the job, people told him, you aren't going to be able to sell out your stadium. Minnesota Golden Gophers fans don't show up for the program like that. And yet here we are in uh, Thursday night. It's going to be a sellout tomorrow night with the gold out. What does that mean to you? I mean, a lot of Husker fans want to sit back and say, well, Husker fans are, are traveling well, and that's what's selling out the stadium. But I don't believe that's yeah. 100% the reason. What does that say to you that – that the Minnesota fans are showing up in force tomorrow night. Well, they're showing up in force, but so are the big red fans. And I don't, I don't mean to throw water on PJ statement or whatever, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, I remember the days at uh, Kansas, even we had good teams and we'd have trouble selling out uh, except when the big red came to town, you know, and I don't th- know of a college team that travels any better than Nebraska does. And it's amazing the commitment there. And you could understand it when they were playing for national championships and, Winning 11 games every year, but they've been on hard times, and they're still out, still selling out Memorial Stadium, and following the Big Red as faithful as anybody in the country. Coach, last thought about a minute or so, and it's awesome to catch up with you. We thank you for your time. Did that tick you off that the Big Red Army invaded? <laughs> well, no, I, I didn't. I always, I always thought if there's if the Big Red had a chance to buy tickets, that wasn't their fault. They were taking care of an opportunity. It was our fault and our fans' fault and, and our commitment, maybe of our lack of a success. I never faulted uh, anything, the success of another team or program. Uh, I didn't want to be um, uh, I didn't want to be envious. I wanted to be just like them. I figured I wanted to strive and be like them. And at, uh, uh, at Kansas, uh, even though we had some good teams, I'd like to be the day that the Corn Huskers were complaining that they couldn't get tickets. <laughs> Coach, enjoy uh, the ball game tomorrow night. We appreciate your insight as always, and we'll do this again. You take care, okay? Great, thank you. All right, good stuff with Glenn Mason, former Gopher head coach. A lot of great years here in Minneapolis, and uh, a great perspective on Nebraska with all those games. He was uh, in Big Eight country with uh, KU. So knows his ball, obviously, and did some great work. Uh, good perspective on, on Rule and, and, of course, Fleck. Evan Bland, volleyball, volleyball day in Nebraska continues. We'll check in with Evan next. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back to it, Hale Varsity Radio. Roadshow in Minneapolis. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal back in Lincoln for Volleyball day in Nebraska on the scene. Evan Bland with the Omaha World Herald. Evan, thanks for a few minutes, man. Good to spend some time with you. What a what a day. What a forty eight hours, twenty four hours. Uh, pick the number, bud. That it's just all about that big red end. I mean, it's hard to believe, and it's a, a Wednesday, Thursday, which kind of adds to the uniqueness of the two days. But man, what a way to 
really officially ring in fall sports. And, um, you know, I kind of wish ideally that maybe these two events were separated by a day or two. So, you know, you could uh, kind of reset and give the next one its due. But yeah, intense time, really fun time. Evan Bland joining us, Sale Varsity Radio, as we're at the graduate here through Friday morning. And uh, Evan, I want to just kind of get your take. You're a, you're a Nebraska guy. You, you've grown up with Husker football, but you also have seen and, and, and know what this volleyball program is. What does tonight mean to you as a Nebraskan, just the ability to get this thing potentially sold out and set a world record? I mean, it's it's what, what's amazing about it is the scope of it, but also the fact that it's not that shocking. Right. Like if you think about the fact that Nebraska volleyball sold out for more than two decades, the fact that they're the only women's sports team that turns a profit, the fact that uh, the state turns out volleyball talent, they turn out Olympians, they win national championships. Like if there's ever a place and a time for this to happen, it feels like it's now. I mean, Nebraska volleyball is at the height of its powers. John Cook uh, is a legend in the sport. Um, you know, the, the athletic department's fully behind this thing. So, like, it just – all these different events sort of coming together for this one grand celebration. And it is. It's, it's very cool. I mean, you think about the – kind of the humble beginnings of Nebraska volleyball in the 70s and uh, how they would put a sign out in front of the NU Coliseum – back then trying to get people from football games to come see them play. Um, And then just to see how it's grown through the Coliseum days, they outgrow that. Now they're at the Devaney, they sell that out and to, to dream a little bit bigger, maybe a lot bigger um, for, for this event at Memorial stadium tonight, really cool celebration. One of those things that in a lot of ways is bigger than the sport. Like I think if Nebraska volleyball wins a national championship this year, I wonder if that will be remembered as much as the event tonight because of just how unique it is for the, for the program, but also for women's sports at large. You said it. I mean, it's, it's bigger than an attendance number. I mean, it's a reality of a program that was started and you have Bob Devaney who brought it in. You had Terry Pettit, you know, pick things up and really started digging for 12 grand a year, Evan. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. And, and then you have John Cook, who, oh, by the way, hey, you want to come be a coach in waiting, even though you've got a, an elite program yourself up in Madtown? I mean, this story is just super mm-hmm. unique. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's both ways, too. Like, it's the program um, and, and the way that it's been a joy for the fans. You know, it's amid all the tumult in Nebraska athletics, like volleyball has been – that shining beacon that's sort of been above it all, right? Like they, they still contend every year. They're still always in the top 25 rankings. That's the thing that's sort of remained untouched as much as college athletics has changed, but it's gone the other way too. It's, it's been a, a love affair with the fans to the program. I mean, they, uh, they show out in central city for, for spring scrimmages. They show out in grand Island. Um, you know, they, they've packed, CHI center when, when Nebraska is there in the final four, they travel like this is, it's, it's such a unique relationship between fan and program. And they just kind of keep upping the ante toward each other. And like, this is kind of the ultimate example of that where, you know, even when they announced this event in the spring, like John Cook, Trev Alberts, like they, they didn't know, like, are you going to get 30,000 people? What's it going to be like? And they kept selling seats and, and filling this thing up. And pretty soon, you know, it's at capacity. So, uh, you know, in, in some ways, and John Cook referenced this at his press conference this week, he, he, he thought of that 1999 Women's World Cup with the U.S. and China and how that sort of pushed the boundaries for how you can perceive women's sports. I think this is another one of those things that uh, even if you're a casual sports fan or not a sports fan at all, like you take notice of something like this. And I think it can really uh, do something for the casual fan. It can uh, maybe get their attention and say, Hey, you know, college volleyball uh, is playing at an elite level. You can, you can apply that to uh, what's going on in, in women's college basketball. Well, women's college softball continues to explode as well. And I think this is just another example of how much women's sports have grown, but how maybe we're not quite near um, the potential that we thought that they maybe were at. Not only is this a celebration of 
volleyball in the state of Nebraska and women's sports as a whole. But this is a, a hell of a recruiting event for current recruits and future recruits, a message to them just about what this volleyball program is and what kind of support they're going to get here compared to everywhere else. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, what other program can, can, I mean, what do you compete against? Like if you're a, if you're a top outside hitter or a top setter, uh, you know, okay. Yeah. You can go to, you can go to Madison and, and get the tour and, and, you know, see the national championship banner hanging last year, uh, the facilities, but like, you're not going to see, what you're going to see this weekend. It's, it's unprecedented. I mean, even, even John cook has never been a part of anything like this. Hasn't seen anything in his career. So like, um, yeah, how much does that, how much of an impression can that leave, you know, on a, on a 17 or 18 year old prospect who's looking to go somewhere. Uh, and, and there's just so much to offer, right? There's the NIL factor. There's just the, the notoriety, the idea of, of developing and going on to be a professional and, and potentially an Olympian, uh, I just, I don't see how you could attend this thing tonight and it looks like the weather is going to hold and it's going to be a nice night. Uh, I don't, I don't see how you can attend this thing, um, and, and then go anywhere else and, and really feel, um, what you would feel in Lincoln, uh, in Memorial stadium. So powerful recruiting tool. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that again, like eight months ago, and nobody ever really thought this sort of thing was possible. Certainly that they wouldn't attract the sort of attention that it has. And again, it feels like we're our imagination for like where this thing can go continues to stretch. So I haven't going to get to football, Nebraska, Minnesota gets kicked off. Uh, you has you asked uh, an important question uh, to rule yesterday before the presser uh, finished up. And that was about the, the start fast, uh, is that something that you want to do? And and his answer to it, su- kind of, well, surprised me because every coach in the history of coaching that I've heard <laughs> seems to say, yeah, dude, it's important to get off on that right foot on the road. Start fast, start fast. But the bigger picture, I understand where, where Coach Rule is coming from. But let's talk, uh, let's talk tomorrow night. Um, I think it's key for Nebraska to, to get a lead and have a lead in that uh, by, by the end of the first quarter, just from a confidence standpoint. Yeah. I mean, confidence for sure. And also, you know, I asked that more because of the way that Minnesota plays with their time of possession, ball control. Like that's not a team that you want to fall behind by, uh, you know, multiple possessions against because you're, they can shorten the game and it's just, it can be hard to, to get the ball back and find some momentum and so, you know, I appreciated Rule's answer, and, and I thought it was it was very notable too. Probably the most notable thing to me uh, that came out of that press conference, other than you know Tristan Alvano being named the starting kicker. But it, uh, you know, to, to to go to the extreme of, of saying like, hey, you know, it's okay if we're down seventeen to nothing because like the fourth quarter is ours. Like that's that's a heavy, heavy emphasis on finishing strong. And you know, to to his credit, like he was able to. To you know, to to re- recount the fact that Nebraska led ten to nothing against Minnesota last year. They score on their first two possessions, and then they they get a field goal the rest of the way. They lose the second half, twenty to three, and they lose the game. So, like, I, the point is well taken that just because you start strong, nothing is guaranteed. But man, what a way to emphasize finishing strong and being a fourth quarter team. And, and I thought his line about uh, NBA basketball or comparing it to NBA <laughs> basketball was pretty good. Like I can relate to that. Like five minutes left, wake me up. I'll watch the end of it. Like I, I, that, that was, uh, there's some truth to that. And so, you know, it is, it's so different from what we've heard from other coaches. Uh, and, and, and I think it's just that sort of that next step in, in kind of changing the mindset of this group where, okay, just because you don't, jump out to really lead the it's, it's not over. Things aren't done. And I think that mindset can apply to the season too, right? Like this is game one of at least 12. And if it doesn't go your way, like, you know, it's not the end of the world. And it kind of felt that way the last couple of years when Nebraska lost that opener, it was like, Oh, you know, you, you can, the wind kind of went out of your sails, but if you, it, it's all, it's all about finishing strong and, and whether that's in this game or this season, I think if you, if you have that mindset, then, then one play, one game isn't sort of the, uh, you know, the, the critical error that it's felt like so many times over the, the past few years. 
And then another quote from that presser that I really liked from Rural was that he said he didn't know how long it was going to take, but he wanted a team that was going to play its best football in the fourth quarter. And I was trying to rack my brain and think back, what type of uphill battle is that to try to change? Because I'm thinking you probably have to go back to the Bo Pelini years to find a team that played their best football in the fourth quarter, That maybe that 2013 squad that went and took down Michigan State at Sparty. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. Like, you know, the, the first half of the Mike Riley era in 2016, you know, they, they start that half of the year undefeated and then tailed off. And and really since then, <clears throat> there they just hasn't been much momentum. I don't think they've won three games in a row at any point since that 2016 season. So there's just – there hasn't been that that exciting finish. I, I'm, I'm sure – I think you're right. Since the, the Bo Pelini era, um, and that was the last time, even just in the second half of the season where – where Nebraska would finish strong and you'd sort of feel that momentum going into the off season. Um, and there's, I think there's some power to that, like just in terms of, of recruiting energy, fan perception, um, you know, how you go about your business, the vigor with which you, you go about your business as a player. I think that matters. Like if you believe that you're building on something and so, you know, we'll, we'll see how that shakes out. I, I do think the second half of the season this year sets up pretty well for Nebraska to finish strong and, and, and to take some momentum into, you know, into next season as well. Um, but, you know, how long has it been since, since maybe Nebraska's out outplayed its expectations going into the season? It's been a long time. And so that the second half of the year, I think is, is the part that people are going to remember, right? Like we've talked about Minnesota and Colorado for so long. I think in some ways we kind of can forget that there are 10 other games coming up after that and, and how we ultimately judge the success of this season, you know, it will, will be by those familiar metrics like bowl games uh, and things like that. But I think it's also going to be, how does Nebraska play in November? Are they playing meaningful football in November? And if they are, then that's going to be uh, on its own, something a lot different than we've seen around here for at least six or seven years. Evan, we'll see you when you get up here, man. Thanks for squeezing us in today. You got it guys. Yep. See you Thursday. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it at Hale Varsity Radio as we're in Minneapolis, geared up for Nebraska, Minnesota. It's a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, how are we feeling? I'm good. How are you guys doing? You feeling good about uh, the big game on Thursday? We uh, will see. <laughs> we're, we're we're talking ourselves all sorts of ways uh, in, into uh, what could and, and may happen. I'm interested here in one of the best there is, Shohei Otani. We've talked about him before. The two-way superstar is still getting it done at the dish despite a torn UCL. And we'll get your thoughts on Otani and a second opinion with this Tommy John. But, Dr. Brandon, how the heck is he still swinging the stick with this injury? Yeah, you know, it's pretty amazing when you think about this. So he probably, as we just kind of dive into this injury, so, you know, number one, it sounds like they're concerned that another kind of Tommy John type injuries happened here. Just to review, we've talked about this before, you know, Tommy John, essentially what we're dealing with is a ligament on the inside of your elbow. So if you bring that elbow out straight, feel on that inside of your elbow, kind of where the uh, funny bone is, if you will, that's called the medial epicondyle. That'd be the top part of where that uh, ligament sits and then it extends down just a little bit into the forearm on that inside part of the arm and essentially that ligament resists the motion so if you to put your arm out straight take it so your palm is up and if you take the elbow in the direction that the thumb is pointing that's what we call a valgus force and so if you think about putting your arm up into a throwing motion all that force that goes across in the valgus direction as they're bringing that ball forward, that ligament essentially is supporting all of that force. So that's what we're talking about with him. He's obviously had a previous uh, Tommy John surgery on that side, and now we're concerned that he's got another injury here. Maybe it's partial. We're not really sure, certain about what uh, the uh, actual extent of his injury is. And so from a hitting perspective, that was kind of getting back to the question there. The big issue there on the hitting perspective is it's not the same kind of directed force. You can change your swing a little bit, and you really don't have that kind of maximum kind of valgus force going across that elbow with hitting, typical like you do with throwing. It's Dr. Brandon Seifert with us here at Jock Doc Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio. And whenever you look at that UCL, Dr. Brandon, what's interesting is the Angels GM said, 
that they are awaiting a second opinion before they'll determine if he needs Tommy John surgery yet again. But he did also say that the tear is in a different part of the UCL than whenever he tore it in 2018 in Japan. So, so take me a little bit through the UCL and the anatomy there. I didn't realize it was possible to be able to tear it in multiple places. Yeah, that's a great question. So we do see this, um, and typically it's more kind of in the chronic type injury or maybe more in kind of maybe a revision uh, scenario. Um, typically, if somebody's going to have their Tommy John fixed the first time, it's usually where the ligament comes down and hooks onto the more of the forearm part. There's a special area there called the sublime tubercle, which is where that initially attaches. And that's typically where most of the pathology happens, at least initially. Obviously, it can happen all throughout the tendon. Um the other areas where this can be more of an issue is after you've had one reconstructed, the way you uh, basically weave that tendon or ligament through the bone, which again is that funny bone or the medial epicondyle, you can get some tearing there. You can have it where if you're sewing that tendon kind of back on itself, you might have maybe some breakage of the suture, maybe some slippage of the ligament in that area. Um, and again, the stresses typically uh, can be a little bit different after a reconstruction, uh, especially depending on kind of where the tunnels were placed. Um, also based kind of on where is the scar tissue at, and really kind of the big thing is how well did it kind of heal or incorporate into the surrounding tissues. So you do tend to see a little bit different kind of wear and tear uh, on these in terms of the second time. The most challenging part I would say probably about these is we don't have a great kind of diagnostic modality for these. So typically we would use an MRI to give you kind of the best image. That's probably our best test that we have out there from an imaging perspective. But even that, and especially in the sense that if you've had a previous reconstruction, there's lots of scar tissue, and it's sometimes really hard to interpret the MRI as to is it tear, is it scar tissue, is it just inflammation? All those kind of things are somewhat challenging unless somebody has you know, a full-on complete rupture, then sure, you can see that, which those are actually quite rare. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Shohei Otani, our topic. So when we talk about Otani getting that second opinion, Dr. Brandon, and him still swinging the stick, I know Bryce Harper did it through the postseason uh, a couple of years back. How, how uh, imperative is PRP when it comes to part of the treatment choices? Uh, how are they keeping things doable despite this injury? You know, I think, Chris, that's a pretty nice modality, especially if you're talking about more partial tears. Um, that is something that, you know, we typically use in our practice here as well. So PRP, you know, if you kind of get to the major league level, they might start sprinkling in some stem cells, although the, the research and data behind that's kind of mixed. Uh, but I think PRP has a fairly reasonable track record here, especially some of the partial tears. Um, but even that's not, you know, a home run. There's even been some pretty uh, extensive research about, fixing some of these partial tears uh, that still have reasonable stability, but athletes are still struggling in their A with velocity or even just with the discomfort of it. Um, And they'll do a thing called an internal brace, which is essentially where you'll take this really kind of thick braided suture and you'll weave that into the tendon, the native tendon that's there to help kind of bring about some more tightening and some more ligamentous support. Although it's not biologic, it's more from a, you know, a, a, synthetically made uh, suture, if you will. Um, and so that's part of this as well. But I think PRP, if you take somebody like him who's already had a previous procedure here, if he's got any kind of evidence of more of a partial, not high grade, I'm thinking you're going to take him down a conservative route with this and be the most likely option. Rest him, you shut him down, you PRP him, they'll probably throw stem cells in there just at that level. And that would be very reasonable. Hey, Dr. Brennan, the Angels today, cutting six players as they're 12 and a half games back in the AL West and 11 and a half games back in the wild card. So I do think him getting shut down is the most likely scenario. But where I think we'll wrap this up, Dr. Brandon, is tell me about if this could have been prevented. Obviously, a lot of people want to go there with the superstar of the game. He missed his start before this start with some arm fatigue as well as some cramping in a finger. Do you think that could have led to the injury we saw? Or is this just one of the things that's going to happen in baseball and there's nothing the Angels could have done about it? At that, it's a, that's a great question, Elijah. Um, at that level, with the number of eyes watching him, um, I think they probably did everything right, and I think they're okay from that perspective. Um, you know, is it maybe you're in another program elsewhere where you don't probably have that many eyes, you don't have that many, you know, <laughs> number one, your agent, two, you have all the money that's flowing through him with the organization, you have your team positions, multiple team positions involved in that second opinion positions there. He's got so many good Washington. So I think they probably did everything right from that perspective. Um, I think this lands more on the side of, you know, you had trauma here before 
they reconstruct it. They're never the same as they were before, even though a lot of players do get back to a certain level. Um, I think this is probably just more wear and tear over time. And either A was had a you know unlucky event happen to him, where he had an awkward swing, perhaps, um, or it just was kind of over time. He's kind of stretched out that graft. And Dr. Brandon, we'll have to wait and see what Shohei's return looks like, whether they're going to move him to more of a closing role where there's less stress or they keep him as a starter. But if he does, in fact, have to undergo Tommy John surgery, what's the timetable before you see him back on a mound again? Oh, with the, with the revision scenario like that, you're probably looking more, it could be 14 to 18 months. Wow. Um, typically, it's kind of a, along that kind of 12 to 14 month pathway. But with the revision scenario, you could go a little longer, maybe up to 18 months, which is a long journey. Do you think that's why they're going and looking for a second opinion, hoping that they're not going to need the surgery? Ultimately, with a with a with a player like him, and at that level, you know, second opinions are, are utilized a lot at that level, um, and so that's honestly probably pretty standard protocol. I can tell you, you know, where I trained it with Dr. Andrews, is the guy that does all the major league folks. We would get second opinions from all. It was amazing having second opinions would come through just wondering about an opinion and what the treatment options would be. So he'll probably, I honestly, I think he'll probably grab another, you know, two or three opinions. Dr. Brandon, have yourself a good week. Thanks for your, your insight on this today. Thanks fellas. You guys have a great rest of your week. And now, and now back to Hale varsity radio. One final time, Hale Varsity Radio on the road here in Minneapolis. Uh, gear it up for Nebraska, Minnesota tomorrow. Uh, locally, we'll be on uh, 6 to 9 a.m. on KFOR for the morning show. And then back at it for Hale Varsity, 4 to 6 tomorrow leading up to kickoff. And then Real Red Reaction follows the Nebraska-Minnesota game. And we'll do it all over again on Friday. So we're... Uh, Set up, ready to go. It is football season. You have made it. You have, as Matt Rule says, you want to limp to the finish line or do you want to accelerate, right, to the finish line? Finish line's here as uh, an incredible sports weekend for Nebraska for your 2023, of course, volleyball day in Nebraska slash the uh, United States tonight, 7 o'clock with What's happening with Nebraska, UNK, and Wayne State going toe-to-toe right now. Jacob Padilla again with Hale Varsity and Herdad doing a great job of covering volleyball. So follow him on Twitter at HVarsity. Check that at uh, Jacob Padilla underscore. You follow the radio show at HVarsity Radio. Uh, give that a follow. Watch the show. Stream us. So many of your comments on the Hale Varsity YouTube stream. That will keep coming. Uh, Vic, yes, you got your shout out at 4.09 Central Time. Vic wants everyone to know that Nick Monroe, native Minnesotan, quarterbacks coach, corner max coach for Minnesota, and uh, Phenom at Syracuse last year, worked for Mr. White. I don't know if he was skinny Peter Badger, but you get well, you get my point. Um, there's some familiarity, Elijah. You still got to stop what you may know Nebraska wants to do. You don't know the personnel, though. We, yeah. we had a little text exchange about scheme and personnel. You got to go play and, and make it happen. It's one of Charlie's favorite quotes, Schmitty. It's not about the X's and the O's. It's about the Jimmy's and the Joe's. Jim, Joe's. We've heard sure. that one plenty. And, and the simple fact of the matter is, yeah, he might have some inside knowledge on the three three five and how Tony White likes to operate. But at the end of the day, Nebraska's got vastly different personnel than Syracuse mm-hmm. had last year. And Nebraska's going to have to change their scheme in order to accommodate those personnel. At least you would hope. If, if they want to win football games this year, you would hope that they have changed their scheme in some way, shape, or form to accommodate those players. Just just so you know, um, Syracuse has intercepted 58 passes in 60 games. <laughs> Going back to 2018, this was a nice find for Coach Fleck to get a seven-year guy who killed it at Syracuse, one of the top uh, recruiters in the country. And this weird triangle continues to get weirder because the guy who replaced Nick Monroe at Syracuse, say it with me, Travis Fisher. So, all sorts of interesting. Yeah, full it's circle, all full right? Circle. 
Full circle. It is uh, Miller time. It is beer 30. Get it going. Enjoy your volleyball tonight. Thank you, Husker Athletics, for all you do. We uh, we love getting to cover you, and uh, we want to see you here at the graduate if you're making your way to Minneapolis as uh, kickoff tomorrow at 7. We're on till 6. Roadshow Hale Varsity. Big thanks to Lazares. Big thanks to Sauter Heyman for making that happen. Just the first of many road shows because we're in Boulder in a week. Hail Varsity back at you tomorrow. Podcast is Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Thanks to Elijah Herbal. Chris Schmidt. Talk to you tomorrow.